Here in the heart of China, humans have been battling against nature for more than a decade. China is pitting the age's most advanced technology against the mighty Yangtze River. The result is the biggest and most powerful dam ever built. Employing over 40,000 people, it's China's biggest project since the Great Wall. From the groundbreaking to the completion of the world's largest ship locks, this film chronicles the progress and price for the world's biggest and most controversial dam. This is the story of the Three Gorges Project, China's mega dam. In August 1998, China was devastated by the worst floods in 44 years. Over 3,000 Chinese lost their lives, and more than 2 million were displaced. The same number driven from New Orleans by Hurricane Katrina. Two million troops were rushed in to fight the Yangtze's rising waters. The world's fastest and most dangerous river was living up to its reputation. Throughout that month, soldiers and farmers fought in vain as one by one the dikes collapsed and lives were lost. An area the length of Colorado was flooded. The human cost was enormous. At their height, the floods affected nearly 300 million people. That's equal to the population of the United States. The people of the Yangtze suffered disastrous floods, on average every 10 years. In the last century alone, floods have killed over 300,000 people. From the days of the emperors to the communists of today, China's leaders have dreamt of stopping these disastrous floods. They now think they have a solution. To complete the building of the world's biggest dam, and tame one of the world's most dangerous rivers. Started in 1994, this is the world's largest construction project ever. 40,000 people have worked day and night to make this dam happen. The dam will cost $25 billion. But this staggering figure is still a billion dollars less than the cost of the August 98 floods. When completed, the dam will be 1.4 miles long and 607 feet high. That's just as long and more than twice as high as the Golden Gate Bridge. It is one of the few man-made objects that can be seen clearly from space. In order for the dam to succeed, enormous hurdles have to be overcome and potentially devastating consequences must be faced. No nation has ever built a dam so big. The Three Gorges project is just, it's just hyperbole about everything. It's, it's the biggest dam, it's the most expensive dam, the symbol of man's ability to control nature. So it's just, it's kind of the biggest of everything. But size is a challenge Chinese engineers overcame with skills and ingenuity. Their biggest battle is against nature. The dam is being built in the middle of an earthquake zone. If the dam were to collapse, it would be an economic and humanitarian disaster on a scale never seen before. But China is pushing the limits of 21st century technology to accomplish this incredible feat. If they are successful, the rewards for China's economy will be endless. Positioned on the Yangtze, 1,200 miles upstream from the great port city of Shanghai, the dam will act as a plug 
It will control the river where it narrows through a series of canyons called the Three Gorges. The first general manager of this massive project is one of the world's most brilliant and respected engineers, Mr. Lu Yu Mei. In order to stop the floods in the lower Yangtze, we need to contain the water during high water periods. In a man-made reservoir created by blocking the river with a three-gorgeous stand. We can then release the water from the reservoir in a controlled fashion to prevent flooding. This is the main reason we're building the dam, to prevent flooding. The dam is being built on a river that's been the lifeline of China for the last 5,000 years. The Yangtze, or Long River, begins its journey in the high plateaus of Tibet. Born from ancient glaciers, it plunges over 21,000 feet before cascading into the tributaries of the Yangtze Valley and making its way to the sea. Nearly 4,000 miles long, it ranks third after the Nile and the Amazon. But what made the Yangtze legendary was the beauty of the three gorges. The Wu Gorge, the Chutang Gorge, and the Sealing Gorge were all formed by a movement in the Earth's crust over 40 million years ago. For most of the world, the Three Gorges is known as one of China's biggest tourist attractions. Today, they remain a natural wonder that may not survive the building of the world's biggest dam. The dam will cause the waters to rise over 400 feet throughout the gorge, altering their beauty forever. When construction is complete in 2009, it will supply one-tenth of the electricity for China's 1.3 billion people. But how does a dam work? Daniel Beard is one of the world's leading experts on water technology and large dams. We build dams across the river and what that does is impound water behind the, the wall or the structure that's built and then water is diverted either through the dam or around the dam through turbines to generate electric power. The fascinating thing about large dams is that they take on a life of their own. They become symbols of a country's arrival as a first world nation or a developed nation. Uh, they become symbols of what is owed a people or a community. Uh, they become symbols of people's use of technology. But how do you go about building the world's biggest dam? The first step is to create a dry bed for the dam's foundation. To do this, workers built a new channel around the site that diverted part of the river's flow. This diversion channel carried the entire flow of the Yangtze and accommodated all the river traffic over the first six years of the dam's construction. In order to build the diversion channel, the workers blasted through solid rock. For the dam workers, this is one of the most dangerous jobs on the site. Detonators are made by taping sticks of dynamite to a fuse. The dynamite and the fuses are strapped to long sticks of bamboo before being shoved into pre-drilled holes. More dynamite caps are placed in the hole before the explosion is triggered. A warning siren indicates workers must retreat from the blast site. In the first year of construction alone, workers detonated more than 80,000 sticks of dynamite, 
a blast force equivalent to 20 Hiroshima atomic bombs. The fallout from these explosions fills the air. Every day, 15 tons of dust smothers the site. The rubble from the blast site is used to build two temporary barriers known as coffer dams. Water is then pumped out between the two dams, leaving a dry bed on which to build the foundations of the dam's main wall. This is one of the most dangerous phases of the whole construction process. Until their cement core is built, the coffer dams are made of rubble, which is simply dumped into the river. At this stage, they are extremely unstable. Dump trucks worked in an endless rotation to lengthen these temporary walls. Soil removed from the riverbed loosely binds the rocks. Then pumps inject bentonite, a liquid clay and cement mixture, into a trench in the middle of the coffer dam. The bentonite takes a few days to dry out. Eventually, it hardens into a substance strong enough to form a backbone, which will hopefully prevent the coffer dam's collapse. When the liquid sets, it will remain flexible enough to prevent the structure from cracking under pressure. When the coffer dams are completed and made safe, the water trapped between them is pumped out. The riverbed will then be dry and work can start on the dam's central section. The workers have to race against time and the weather to shore up the coffer dams and make them secure. The scale of this giant undertaking is formidable. If a flash flood were to occur at this stage, the coffer dam would collapse and send a huge tidal wave down the Yangtze, overwhelming everything in its path. China continued to test the limits of engineering as the main dam wall began to take shape in 1997. Dozens of giant cranes took over the work of pouring concrete. 350 buckets of cement, each weighing 20 tons, are lifted into the main dam wall every 24 hours. The proportions used in mixing the cement must be determined scientifically as local climatic conditions affect the drying rate. It takes five minutes to swing each giant bucket across the void to the top of the dam. Once there, it is tipped into a preformed casing where it hardens into a block. One small piece of the dam falls into place. On this site, women as well as men are employed in some of the most skilled jobs including crane operating. These are the largest cranes in the world. Operators have to take an elevator and then climb 400 feet just to get to work every day. As the operator swings the enormous bucket of concrete, engineers below indicate the exact spot where it should be poured. Since September last year, we've been operating right up here at this height. It's much higher than before, but it honestly doesn't scare me too much. To tell you the truth, once you get used to it, the actual height doesn't bother me. It's all the same to me. Just a moment. I have to give it my full attention. It's really complicated up here. There are other cranes around, and you have to be very careful to avoid collisions. Like most of her co-workers, Feng Tse Huai and her family will live amid the noise and dirt of the construction site until the dam is complete. But it's not just the workers who have endured the brunt of the dam's construction. Officially, 1.2 million Chinese people are being driven from their homes over the course of the project. When the Three Gorges Dam is complete, the water level will rise behind it to over 500 feet, creating a reservoir nearly 400 miles long, where once there were thriving river communities. The biggest worry for all those involved is not the technical challenge, but the fate of the million or so people who live along the shores of the Yangtze between the dam and Chongqing. 
All these communities along the riverbanks will have to be moved. The biggest problem is resettlement of people who live in the reservoir area. With the Three Gorges Dam, we can protect the people in the lower reaches, some 15 million people. But it will cause problems for the people in the upper reaches, which will be submerged. Currently, that is about 840,000 people. By the time the dam is completed, by natural increase, this will have become 1.13 million. But experts disagree about the number of people being resettled. I asked the Chinese when I was there, I said, what's the largest number of people you've ever moved for a dam project in your history? And they said 250,000 people in the 1960s. And my assumption was that at that time they were done at the end of a bayonet. Well, now you have a much different country, you have a much different China, and you're going to move two million people? The water started to rise when the river was blocked off in 2003. The reservoir will be completely full by the year 2009. Two major cities, 140 towns, 1,350 villages, and nearly 100,000 acres of farmland will disappear. In 2004, the reservoir was longer than the Grand Canyon. The people whose lives have changed the most are not the city dwellers, but those who have lived along the fertile banks of the Yangtze for generations. The impacts of being resettled on a community are enormous. Uh, I think it's hard for anyone to really understand um, what it's like to have your entire community and culture displaced. And if you are displaced by a dam, it is probably the worst thing that could happen to you almost. Your, your entire culture, um, your history is, is gone. In some villages, the past survives in name only. As late as 1999, walking through Yinyang was like traveling back in time. <laughs> Women spun yarn as they had for centuries. The miller ground winter corn and summer rice on the same millstones used by his grandfather and great-grandfather. Housewives cooked with the traditional wok. The village was almost self-sufficient, producing its own food, making its own clothes. The streets had never heard the sound of motorized traffic. It was a unique way of life. Through self-sufficiency, the village survived centuries of turmoil. This is where the ancient village tree stood for centuries. This was time-hallowed ground that had to be abandoned forever. In 2001, the village was moved up to Yinyang New Town, a government settlement built 500 yards up the hill. Here, the villagers will have to start again without any reminders of their past. The miller and his wife have a new house with luxuries like running water. But many people complain that they miss the sense of community they once enjoyed in their ancient village. 
But Chinese people endure it. They move on, and then they, they will you know, restart their life. And I guess that this uh, Three Gorges Dam project is another good example. And people, so they're so used to the hardships. They say, well, you know, just another you know, bad government you know, telling us to do you know, certain things, and then if we can make it through it, and then there are going to be better days tomorrow. Signs indicating the height of the rising water levels still pepper the Three Gorges area. This was the bridge in 1994. When the dam is finally complete, even the top of the bridge will be underwater. Construction continues at a relentless pace. Nearly 30 million cubic meters of concrete will be poured. The walls stand over 600 feet high. They are thick enough to withstand a conventional missile attack. Over 40,000 workers rotate in 24-hour shifts in a struggle to meet the Chinese government's ambitious deadline. But in April 2002, construction stopped immediately. Engineers discovered cracks on the face of the Three Gorges Dam. They claimed that the materials they use may not have been the best you know, for the past two, three years you know, when they use it for, to, to pour the concrete on, on the dam site. Robin Charlwood is a world expert on large dams. Building a dam of this type with such a large mass of concrete, you place the cement and the water and the aggregate and create a chemical reaction to make the concrete. But in the course of that, that chemical reaction generates heat. And so the inside of this structure would expand, whereas the outside would be cooler and won't. And so what happens in all concrete dams like this is you get a tendency for cracking on the skin. When the cracks appeared, the Chinese government turned to him for an independent analysis. The cracks were just surface cracks. They were less than a millimeter wide and three meters deep. And they would only go in so far, and then they will stop. Assistant General Manager Chao Guanjing agrees. It is safe under any conditions, I think, we, we can protect. Um, the design standard is, uh, is according to the most unfavorable conditions. Even though cracks continue to be found along the length of the dam space, the building of the main wall continues. In 2002, hundreds of ships still pass through the dam's diversion channel on a daily basis. The commerce and tourism industry of the Yangtze is too vital to be stopped, not even for the construction of the dam. Captain Tan is typical of most Chinese riverboat captains. In 1999, we joined him on his final voyage through the gorges, as he has known them. As skipper of the White Swan, he spent almost half a century on the river and is about to retire. When only 16 years old, Tan first sailed through the gorges as a crewman. On that trip, his boat was dashed to pieces. 17 steamships met their end here between 1900 and 1945. The swift currents and large boulders destroyed many vessels. In order to be safe, you must know the riverbed, the size of the boat, and the water level. And you must know if the boat can go through the channel. If you don't consider all those factors, Life will be lost. Captain Tan is heading toward the city of ghosts, a temple overlooking the port of Fangdu. This is one of the most important religious sites not only along the Yangtze, but in all of China. It's haunted with Buddhist demons and devils. Their mission is the endless punishment of human sinners.
According to legend, the tortures that awaited the wicked in hell were reported by inmates who were allowed to return to life. Their horrifying vignettes are housed in a series of temples constructed about 14 centuries ago. The city of ghosts will survive the flood. But in 2009, the entire port city of Fengdu will be underwater. Only one building will survive high above the hill, the ghost temple that for centuries safeguarded the city. By 2004, the former port had truly become a city of the dead. Most of the inhabitants were moving to a new town built across the river. But for all its doom and gloom, some locals believe the temple has brought them good fortune. This is the government's policy. My friends and relatives are still here. The new city is only across the river from here. It is not far away. The new city is good, of course. The houses are modern. These are all old houses. David Lee was born on the Yangtze close to Fangdu. He was a river guide for 16 years. Now he's come back to witness the city's final days. It's very good, very happy for little kids or young people to be relocated because they're going to have better living condition, better education, and better opportunities, job opportunities. But for those people in their golden age, probably they prefer to stay. I worry about those people. Meanwhile, surrounding cities and villages like Dachang braced themselves for the waters that began to rise in 2003. Dachang was one of China's best preserved Ming Dynasty towns. This was Da Chang in 1997, before the waters came. Villagers had just received word they would have to move. <laughs> Madame Wang lived in the oldest house in Da Chang with her husband and her younger son's family. The people in Beijing told us it will be just like what you see on TV. You move to a new village, which is more modern, with running water, and where there will be gardens. We'll miss this house. We've been here for 400 years. That is up to my mother's time for 12 generations. When we move, I'll just miss it. We don't want to move. I mean, I just don't know how I'll tear myself away. This was Da Chang eight years later. Already the water had risen 20 feet.
half the town had been demolished. Only a handful of villagers remain. One of them is Madame Wong. This time, she wasn't allowed to speak with us. Her house is empty. Her family is gone. She spends her last days in the village praying silently for a reprieve that will not come. A few weeks later, Madame Wong and the other residents were moved to New Dachang. Rumors of civil unrest prevented our cameras from getting closer to the village. August 2003, a milestone in human achievement. After eight years of continuous work by a quarter million people, the main wall of the Three Gorges Dam is completed. It towers 607 feet and stretches for over a mile. The diversion channel is filled and all river traffic comes to a halt for the first time in 3,000 years. And now, instead of a smoothly flowing river, ships face a 600-foot wall. So how will they cross the dam? By passing through the largest set of locks in the world. It took six years of blasting to make room for these giant passageways. Ten huge holes were gouged out of the earth from solid granite. After eight years of construction, the holes were transformed into the shipping lock stretching out over four miles. The Three Gorges locks are a double system, one for upstream traffic and the other for downstream. Construction was complex, but the concept is simple. Water flows into a series of holding tanks. Once sealed, they can raise or lower a ship up to 100 feet per lock. The locks can accommodate a ship weighing up to 10,000 tons. All the locks are controlled by engineers from the navigation control room. Our team was one of the first Western film crews to gain access to this highly secure room. Like air traffic controllers, these technicians coordinate every movement of every ship through every lock. After the ship enters the first lock, the controllers close the 800-ton doors. With the push of a button, 300,000 gallons of water fill the lock at 100 gallons per second. almost an hour to fill each lock. Five locks and four hours later, the ship exits the final set of doors and continues its journey down the Yangtze. The Three Gorges project has been a boom for large ship commerce.
but it may sink a way of life that stretches back 4,000 years. Until work began on the dam, there were no roads connecting the three gorges. For local villagers, the only way to move goods and people was by small, handmade boats. On the Daning River, a boat trader's cooperative lands with a cargo of pigs at a waterside village. By time-honored tradition, the villagers feed the boatmen before they return to their sampans. This sharing of bounty reflects the culture of a people grateful for the river that binds them together. Boatmen learn to run the river as soon as they're old enough to walk. Villagers learn to work the land and reap a rich harvest of rice, corn, and vegetables. Reliance on each other forged a bond that has endured for centuries. But as the Yangtze rises behind the Three Gorges Dam, these low-lying villages are disappearing, along with the customs that mark each one. By 2004, the water behind the dam had risen 500 feet, and for the first time, the great Yangtze River was not only navigable, but safely so for large ships. Riverboat Captain Tan and his generation are a living testimony to the triumphs and tragedies of life on the Yangtze. Surveying the shore from his pilot house, he summons the memory of a time when danger lurked around every bend and death was commonplace. Here along the rocky edge of the river, an army of men and boys called trackers lived and died. Until the 1940s, when boats were powered by their own steam, vessels weighing as much as 120 tons were pulled upriver by human muscle. The river flowed fast and the path was narrow. If you fell, you died. Hitched to lines made of bamboo, straining with bent backs, their fingers almost touched the ground. As they pulled, they sang to ease the pain. A troop of singers, many former trackers, still perform the songs of their youth. One in 20 boats were destroyed, but no one knows how many trackers were pulled to their deaths. The only monument to their sacrifice the shore has vanished with the coming floods. Today, the only remaining trackers pull tourists upstream. Captain Tan makes his way upstream toward the magnificent temple called Shibozai, or Stone Precious Temple. Over 180 feet high, it's the tallest wooden structure in China, built during the Ming Dynasty in the 14th century. The most breathtaking feature is the view from its towering pagoda. Located on a rocky outcrop, the pagoda's internal staircase winds upward for 12 stories. The builders used no nails. The structure was lashed into holes carved into the cliff face. At the summit of the pagoda is a Buddhist temple active until the Cultural Revolution in 1966. 
everything below the temple will be underwater in 2009. But officials hope to rescue the complex with an ambitious project. To save it, plans have been drawn to build a massive wall around the base of the pagoda. If they are successful, the structure will become a virtual island within the Three Gorges Reservoir. In 2002, the ancient village that once surrounded the temple was demolished in preparation for the rising waters and the final wall. Eighty miles downriver, engineers have overcome another monumental challenge. In 1997, the ancient temple of Xiangfei was due to be inundated by the rising Yangtze. This figure indicates the height of the water by 2003. The temple commemorates Zhongfei, a heroic general from the second century. He helped purge the land of corruption but was ultimately murdered by his own treasonous officers. In the 1960s, Chairman Mao's Red Guards ransacked some of China's most sacred places. Not only was Yang Fei's temple threatened, but also its collection of some of the greatest calligraphy of the Yangtze Valley. Such historical treasures suffered damages and destruction during the Cultural Revolution. So to save these cultural relics, intellectuals here wrote Chairman Mao's quotations on the reverse sides. No Red Guard would dare destroy the thoughts of Mao, so the priceless tablets of Zhang Fei Temple survived. In the face of a new threat, a far more audacious plan was conceived. In 2002, engineers carefully deconstructed the temple and moved it to higher ground seven miles away. There was only one road to transport materials between locations. In 2003, the new Zhangfei temple was open to the public locals are pleased with the effort. Now they can enjoy views of the temple from their new homes across the river. Today, workers are putting the final touches on the outer walls that will surround the structure. But for every temple saved, many more will be lost. Behind the Three Gorges Dam, another man-made creation rises. Inch by inch, it slowly fills, creating a lake the length of Arizona an inland sea in the middle of China. Its weight is so massive, experts project that it could slightly alter the Earth's axis and increase the length of every day by a microscopic amount. Very large dams have also been known to trigger earthquakes because of their weight pressing down on the Earth's crust. Earthquakes created these mountains millions of years ago and earthquakes could strike again at any moment. The reservoir area is straddling a fault line, so there is a real chance that the underlying foundation of the dam underneath the reservoir is not as stable as the engineers are hoping and assuming. If the dam failed, there would be a, a massive tidal wave that would move down the Yangtze, and it would lead to the death of, I would estimate, millions, and it would certainly lead to the destruction of billions of dollars worth of assets uh, and, uh, and, and to the long-term disability of the country. When you're building the world's biggest dam, the problems are many and solutions aren't easy. Even small mistakes can have devastating consequences. Every engineer who's in the dam building business is concerned about dam safety. And they take it very seriously. 
because they know the consequences are very great. It's a very high-risk venture. In the United States, we had a very large dam failure in the 1970s. The Teton Dam in Idaho was constructed. They began to fill it, and as they filled it, it gave way, and people were killed, and millions of dollars worth of damage were incurred. But for now, engineers wrestle with a more immediate problem. In 2006, reports of ships frequently running aground was starting to concern activists and officials. Silt built up at the reservoir in the city of Chongqing had reached critical levels. When you build a dam on the main stem of a river, it completely changes the hydrology of the system. And you go from a flowing system to essentially a lake. Whatever was downstream that depended on certain volumes of river, certain uh, volume of sediment, uh, now doesn't get that. Sediment, or silt, is the term used for the fine particles carried out to sea by fast-moving rivers. With the new dam, the Yangtze flows much slower, and the silt has nowhere to go. The Three Gorges Reservoir is going to be the length of Lake Superior, um, and most of the silt is going to start piling up at the furthermost end of the reservoir. When the silt starts to pile up at the upper end of the reservoir, there's very little that the dam operators can do with that problem. People have predicted that this is going to create a huge flooding problem upstream. But engineers believe they have anticipated the problem. In the flood season, uh, I, from, uh, normally from uh, May to September, we keep the level of the reservoir as low as possible. They lower the reservoir by opening sluice gates at the base of the dam. The water released contains most of the silt. So man does with technology what nature does naturally. But as a major technical problem is addressed at the dam, a million human stories are unfolding on the upper Yangtze. We join Captain Tan as he travels to the village where he was born. Along the river, he passes by hundreds of villages being dismantled in preparation for the rising water. All along the 250-mile reservoir, people have been ordered to tear down their homes and businesses. Here in Singtan, the old buildings are being destroyed to minimize navigation hazards after the flood. It will also prevent squatters from moving in after the residents leave. The population is being moved to modern housing complexes that dot the hills high up on the slopes of the gorges. New Singtan will overlook its submerged former self. Stranded in one of the poorest areas of China, few inhabitants of Singtan can even afford a snapshot of their doomed homes. Events once linked to street corners and courtyards, weddings, births, and deaths, the history of an entire town will slip out of sight, like a family photo album lost to a flood. Farther down the Yangtze, Captain Tan is traveling to his hometown of Kutiko to see it again before it disappears. He's come to see his friends and relatives and visit the home where he grew up one last time. The water level has already begun to rise and his village, like so many others, will completely disappear by 2009. A Chinese poet wrote that a lifetime is like a finely spun thread. The thread that binds Captain Tan to his village and the river below is about to break. Tomorrow, his lifelong adventure will come to a close. Not only will Captain Tan's village disappear, but his family will be moved hundreds of miles away.
By the time it's finished, this will be the world's biggest power plant. 32 hydropower generators will produce enough clean energy to supply up to 10% of China's electricity. That's enough power to light up Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. combined. This is the heart and soul of the Three Gorges project. When complete, it will produce almost 19 gigawatts of electricity. Hydropower is electric power generated using the energy of falling water. There's only one law that you need to generate power, and that's the law of gravity. As long as we don't repeal gravity, water's going to flow downhill. And as it flows downhill, we capture it, divert it through a tunnel, and run it through a turbine. And as the turbine spins, it creates electricity. Once the Yangtze rises to full height behind the dam, this gateway will catch the flow of water and drop it 300 feet into the turbines. After spinning through the turbine, the superheated water is pumped back into the Yangtze through underwater pipes. This half-mile-long concrete bunker is home to the generators, or turbines, that store the electricity that will power China. The massive turbines are lifted into place by specially built cranes that ride on rails along the top of the bunker. They are the largest turbines in the world, and the Chinese paid a fortune for them, $150 million apiece. It's one of the most heavily guarded sites in China. Workers pass through 14 checkpoints every day to reach the nerve center. This is a very rare view of one of the most secret rooms in China. Every operation of the power plant is controlled from this command post. In 2006, 14 generators are up and running. When all 32 generators are installed by 2009, they will create as much electricity as 18 nuclear power plants. Turbines are monitored, heat gauges checked, and the power flow to cities is regulated. Leo Haibuo runs one of the most powerful rooms in the world. I'm very proud to be working for the Three Gorges project. This is my biggest dream as a hydroelectric engineer. That's why I will do my best. With great power comes great risk. In 2003, a small glitch in one of the generators shut down the whole hydroelectric station. More than 500,000 people lived without power for three weeks. Imagine the entire city of Las Vegas coming to a standstill for nearly a month. But at least the generator did shut down. An overheated generator could have blown up and caused catastrophic damage to the structure. Virtually the entire $25 billion investment in the Three Gorges Dam would have been lost along with thousands of lives. But despite concerns over dam safety, there is no doubt that the hydropower from the Three Gorges Dam will go a long way to alleviate the crushing pollution problems that China faces. China is the world's largest producer and consumer of coal in the world. It accounts for 70% of the country's total energy consumption. Carbon emissions are damaging the environment. Few Chinese remember what a clear day looks like. The Three Gorges area of Yangtze, from Chongqing in the west to Wuhan in the east, is the heart of industrial China. Smoke from these factories has made China one of the world's biggest polluters. Every year, acid rain falls on over two-thirds of the country. China's leading cause of death is heart disease, 
caused by the burning of coal from steel smelters and rolling mills. By eliminating the burning of coal, the air would be noticeably clearer and smog levels would decrease in most major cities. The Yangtze is the second most traveled river in the world. Only the Mississippi carries more ships along its shores. The fast and dangerous waters of the Three Gorges have long been a shipping bottleneck, but the dam's construction has widened and deepened the channel, allowing more ships to travel up and down the river. The dam's sophisticated lock system has already tripled the area's large ship commerce. But building the world's largest dam wasn't enough of a challenge for Chinese engineers. Now they're building the world's largest ship lift, an elevator for boats. Here, the foundations of a ship elevator are being constructed. The elevator will be a vast steel box driven by a mechanism strong enough to lift a 3,000-ton ship inside. The box will contain 13 feet of water, enough to keep a ship balanced. It will be like carrying a modern destroyer up and over the Washington Monument in just 42 minutes. The installation of the lift combined with the locks will more than quadruple the cargo traffic of the Yangtze. But this grand idea may never get off the ground. Engineers have built the housing for the lift, but not the mechanism to do the lifting. You have to lift all the weight of the water, which is very heavy, and the weight of the ships inside this, basically a bathtub. It's just such a heavy load to be lifting on a track that it's a very difficult thing to design. Today, the Chinese say the lift is still a work in progress. Others say the Chinese may have overreached. Just daring to build such a gargantuan machine shows how determined the Chinese are to keep traffic moving along the Yangtze. But with great risks comes the possibility of great economic success as China hurtles away from communism and embraces capitalism. Mega cities are the main beneficiaries of the dam. On the South China Sea lies the industrial and commercial powerhouse of China the great city of Shanghai. Recipient of much of the power from the dam, this city is the engine of the Chinese economy. But with the Yangtze much more navigable due to the dam, a new industrial dragon has emerged in central China. This is the urban heart of the municipality of Chongqing. It is home to over 30 million people and is one of the largest metropolitan areas on Earth. It is now challenging Shanghai as one of the great industrial cities of capitalist China. So fast is Chongqing changing that the city has a saying, turn your back for a day and you won't find your way home. Every street corner, every block, is inhabited by cranes and builders. This is the China promised by the Three Gorges Dam. A few short years ago, the people who lived along Chongqing's riverbanks practiced a slower lifestyle. Leisurely playing mahjong, a game enjoyed by the Chinese for thousands of years along these banks. Now their old homes have been turned into new apartment blocks. The old streets of Chongqing are disappearing every day. Long-time residents are coming to terms with the future. Before Mr. Zhang Jiang left his family home for an apartment in the new city, he painted a picture to help him remember. While China's industrial boom of the 1990s belonged to Shanghai, the first decade of the 21st century belongs to Chongqing. The government will spend $200 billion over the next 25 years to triple the size of its highways. Chongqing's auto production has skyrocketed, 
fulfilling ambitions of it becoming the Detroit of China. Nearby, hundreds of new factories are being built and providing new employment to millions of Chongqing citizens. Ten miles from downtown, the Zhangshan Motorcycle Factory is racing to keep up with demand. This single plant makes over two million motorcycles a year. That's more than Harley-Davidson's worldwide production in an entire decade. Hundreds of employees work in three shifts, keeping the line moving 24 hours a day. Ten assembly lines are constantly running, drilling, wrenching, building, and testing at top speed. Every 42 seconds, another bike rolls out. This is the new China. As the Three Gorges Dam propels China into the future, the rising water erases its past. As the dam nears completion, the water behind it rises, inch by inch, foot by foot, day by day, triggering the greatest ever archaeological rescue project. Along the Yangtze River Basin, an area has been identified as a cultural hub of ancient China, a new unexplored center of human civilization. When the entire island of Zhongba was slated for destruction in 1993, archaeologists gained invaluable insights into Yangtze culture. Before it was leveled, archaeologists dug a series of trenches. A few feet down, they hit pay dirt. They found pottery made by an ancient culture known as the Ba. When the pots were reassembled, their eccentric shapes and abstract decorations revealed an imaginative and enigmatic people. These unusual symbols appear to be a new language, but so far no one has been able to crack the code. Dr. Yu Wei Chao is the former director of the Beijing History Museum. In the Three Gorges area, there are over 1,200 Asian sites, above ground and underground. They have great historical value, especially regarding the Ba race. These were a people who were extremely brave in war, but who loved dancing and singing as well. We hope to understand more about the Ba culture before it gets completely washed away in the flood, so we can share it with the world. This was the scene in 1997 at an archaeological site in Zhaungba, an island in the middle of the Yangtze. In any other country, this site alone would be a big dig. Here in the Yangtze Valley, it's just one of many hundreds. Beneath the soil lay ancient artifacts and ancient graves, each a clue to how and when the Yangtze was settled. To find them, workers had to remove hundreds of tons of soil by hand. Excavation could only be done in the spring, during the dry season. Archaeologists discovered that not all of the pottery at Jaungba is the same age. Instead, it spans thousands of years, suggesting the site was continuously occupied. The buildings of one culture were constructed on the ruins of another, making Jaungba a layer cake of Yangtze history. 10,000 workers were spread out along 600 historic sites up and down the Yangtze River. Never have so many people tried to save so much in so little time. But funding was tight. Building the Three Gorges Dam is costing $25 billion. Less than 1% has been earmarked to save cultural treasures. 
In advanced countries, that percentage could be between 3 to 5 percent of the construction budget. We originally hoped the three quarters area, because of its Asian culture and historical importance, would also recover 3 to 5 percent. It didn't. Archaeologists were still digging at Jongba in 2004 when water covered the site. Imagine Shakespeare's birthplace, Egypt's Valley of the Kings, and the battlefields of Gettysburg, all submerged beneath hundreds of feet of water, and one might understand the enormity of what will be lost. Over 1,200 known archaeological digs along the Yangtze, some dating back 4,000 years, will vanish along with another 8,000 unexplored sites. In southern Italy, the ancient city of Pompeii, which was destroyed by a volcano 2,000 years ago, can still be visited, even excavated today. However, the very soil in the Three Gorges area will be scattered and gone once it comes into contact with water from the flooding. It will be gone forever. It is an irreparable loss, and we must do our best to save it. I think the loss of those antiquities affects the, the Chinese psyche. It affects the soul of China. But through the efforts of archaeologists and volunteers, thousands of artifacts were recovered. So urgent was the mission, the government commandeered private boats to ferry the relics to safety. Every month, for seven years, thousands of relics were shipped to the Chongqing Museum. The treasures were stored in high security vaults. The security system in the vault was so secret, only a handful of film crews have ever been allowed inside. Artifacts have been found faster than they can be catalogued. Few have been studied in detail. But one thing is known. The museum's growing collection proves that Yangtze artisans were endowed with great skill and vision. Some 2,000 years ago, they created masterworks of porcelain. This Yangtze maiden is a world-class example of elegant simplicity. This ornate belt buckle depicts a rhinoceros, an animal experts say roamed southern China centuries ago. Gold objects are rare in China. This exquisite bowl is over a thousand years old. Here, a golden turtle chop. On the bottom, the owner's name. Pressed in ink, it was used to stamp important documents. A golden hair brooch, only a few inches long. It is a masterpiece of workmanship. All in miniature, it glitters with exotic horses and their riders. On the back, a centuries-old birthday greeting. By 2001, the number of recovered relics overwhelmed the museum. It was forced to close. During construction of a larger museum, it was turned into a giant warehouse of treasures. By 2004, the artifacts spilled out into the gardens. Their tempting presence creates an unforeseen problem in the vast scheme of the Three Gorges project, looting. It started when construction began 10 years ago and continues today.
new roads have opened the way for the lucrative trade. Peasants and other people in that area are uh, realizing they can grow wealthy from finding these antiquities. Gangs and other groups are uh, uh, involved in this as well. When someone finds something, they're paid off. Very often it winds up in some sort of network that goes either to uh, the south or to north China and then finds its way out of China into Taiwan or other areas, Japan and the west, for example. These gangs are very sophisticated. They have up-to-date equipment, cell phones, and other kinds of equipment. They're well-funded, much better funded than the local authorities, the police, and the local preservationists. So that in the race for these antiquities, the people who are getting them out of the country are winning over the people who are trying to keep them in the museums. Theft from museums is alarmingly on the rise. Nine rare bronzes were recently stolen from the Chu Yuan Temple. Works of art belonging to the Zhang Fei Temple have also disappeared. In Funjiai, peasants hunting for artifacts assaulted officials who tried to stop them. This rare bronze tree, dating from the first century AD, was allegedly stolen from a city near Three Gorges Dam. In 1998, it sold at a New York art gallery for $2.5 million. Professor Han Han is one of the archaeologists who led the drive to save the treasures of the Yangtze. We found this pair of Han Quan by the banks of Yangtze River. I suspect they were from the Tang Dynasty, but uh, they were lost during the Song Dynasty. There were no records of such items. Nobody knew of their existence during the Tang Dynasty. This is a surprise find. We knew of only 30 places in China where we can find such pieces. Because they were buried underneath the mud, they've been well preserved for centuries. This pair is the most important piece in the Three Gorges Museum. They will have a prominent place in the center hall. Near the old museum, the new one rises. The Three Gorges Dam is responsible for another massive building project. The Chongqing Museum must be big enough to store more than 300,000 artifacts. But that's only a fraction of what was recovered. No one will ever know how much was lost. Slowly and steadily, the river begins to creep up its banks. As the Yangtze rises, it will claim an area of over 36,000 square miles. This was Wushen, a city of more than 20,000 people before it was claimed by the rising waters of the Yangtze. Its history extends a thousand years, and it was one of China's great commercial port cities. Today, nothing remains. In 2003, the last residents had left the town and moved to new Wushen, higher up in the hills. Nothing remains of the old city. It has been submerged by the dam. But it's more than bricks and mortar being left at the bottom of the river. It's also hundreds of thousands of graves. To the Buddhist Chinese, burial grounds are alive with spirits. Losing the ancestors' gravesite is uh, definitely a, a, a no-no for Chinese people. Because Chinese people are, uh, are very proud of their long histories. You know, they always teach their children you know, who they are and where they're from, who their ancestors are. You know, they always teach them histories. You know, they're so proud of their 5,000 years of history. You know, they have a special day. It's a day that you go in, you know, to the graveyards to visit your ancestors. You bring food. 
you go there and then you try to chit chat with your, your ancestors. Tell them that you're doing very well, your kids are doing very well. Of all the sacrifices the Chinese are making for the dam, this one may create the deepest wound. If I were them, I'd probably go crazy, I'd go insane, and I'd go try to sue some people or try to maybe pick, some, pick a fight against the government officials. You know, if, they give, if you give them the proper channel, I think they will, they will explode. <laughs> they will let you know that they are very angry. For millions of Chinese along the Yangtze, there is no solution to this loss of family tradition. But for some, there is hope. Many communities have decided to pool their funds and fight the rising water. The city of Fuling, situated where the Yangtze and the Wu River meet, is an example of this. This was what the great city of Fuling looked like in 1997. On the main shopping streets, Signs indicated how high the waters of the reservoir would be when the dam is completed. It served as a constant reminder to the people that not much of their city will survive for long. They are being relocated to New Fuling, an extension of the town higher in the hills. Rather than abandon their city entirely, citizens decided to save as much of the city as they could by building a 600-foot wall nearly three miles long. But staying put came at a price. In order to build the new wall, over one-third of the city had to be demolished. After the completion of the flood control levy, it will have four main functions. First is anti-flooding, second is tourism, third is development, and the fourth is navigation. The structure is very aesthetically pleasing, which is why the Fuling people call it the Shanghai Outer Banks. This is what New Fuling looked like in 2005. a bustling metropolitan center almost twice the size of Seattle. The rebuilt city now overlooks the man-made wall protecting it. Sadly, the wall could not save a national treasure that once laid upon the city's banks. During periods of drought, the waters of the Yangtze receded low enough to reveal an extraordinary sight. This rare archival footage of White Crane Ridge documents a bar of sandstone covered with stylized carvings of fish. The eyes of the fish mark low tide. They were first carved in the 8th century Additional inscriptions provide a detailed record of times of drought, a clue to whims of ancient climate. They span a thousand years. White Crane Ridge will never be seen again. Even at low tide, it's under 20 feet of water. It has been lost forever. The city of Fu Ling mourns the loss of its unique cultural heritage. But at the same time, it is glad that most of the city itself has been saved by the flood. Despite successes, many believe that the loss of cultural relics will affect tourism in the area, and that the dam will so change the landscape that tourists who numbered nearly a million in 2004 will stop coming. This is iconic rural China filled with sites as uniquely Chinese as the Great Wall, 
or the Forbidden City in Beijing. Huan Ping, who has sailed the Yangtze most of his life, is upbeat. The gorges will always be here, and we will continue to take tourists up and down this beautiful river. Everyone hopes he's right. The Three Gorges area is one of the poorest on Earth. More than 1.3 million Americans, 2.8 million Koreans, and well over 3 million Japanese visit China every year. Locals depend on tourists for a steady flow of Japanese yen, Korean won, and American dollars. This map selling for a few dollars will keep a family in food for a week. Without tourism, life would be even harder. We're moving people off their lands so that the benefits of large dams can be shipped off to cities or to large farmers, many of whom don't, don't need it as much. The sad thing to me is that the people most in need aren't receiving these benefits. If we really care about helping poor people, there are a myriad other ways of doing it that are more direct and more effective. Yet backers of the dam believe it will save more than livelihoods. It will save lives. It started in 1994. It won't end until 2009. Around the clock, work on the world's largest dam continues. Now on the brink of completion, the Chinese have almost accomplished an engineering feat that many considered impossible. It's like looking at the Great Pyramids, people say, how in the world did they build that? Chinese officials recently reported that work was progressing even faster than anticipated. They are nearly a year ahead of schedule. But the building of the largest dam in the world has come at a price. Rising waters have swept away ancient villages that have existed since the beginning of time. We're building large dams in the name of alleviating poverty. And the sad thing to me is that the people most in need aren't receiving these benefits. As a dam, it's going to bring us lots of benefits. But of course, you have to take the good with the bad. The bad was good. I still worry about those people who have been relocated because I still remember their smiles. When the Three Gorges Dam is fully operational, then a great nation will have truly built a wonder for the ages. The dam is a result of modern engineering ingenuity, combined with the ambition of a sleeping giant awakening to the future. The Three Gorges Dam project is a really amazing engineering achievement. They've, they've pushed the limits, they've, they've pushed the envelope in the sheer scale. They've brought in international technology from all around the world and they've put it together. I think they deserve a huge amount of credit. For better or for worse, there is no turning back the clock. Too much has been invested and too much has been gambled for the project not to succeed. Ultimately, this is a story about China's future as well as its past. The Chinese people will decide how much of their 3,000-year-old history they will take with them and what they must leave behind. The dam promises prosperity and a catapulting of a great nation into the future, as well as providing protection from floods that have caused death and destruction since people first walked on the shores of the Yangtze. But this protection and prosperity come at a price. The sacrifice and loss incurred in the name of progress will reverberate from beneath the reservoir for another 3,000 years. But what is for certain is the soul and spirit of China 
will survive even though the Yangtze Valley has been altered forever. The river that has been called the Great Dragon, since stories have been told around village fires, has not easily been tamed. But when the dam is complete, then China will have built a technological wonder. The dam will stand as a spectacular modern monument to economic progress, as well as a solemn testament to what has been left behind, silenced forever beneath the waters.